Hello, today we're going to look at some tie downs and fixings specifically for trust roofs, although what we're going to discuss today can be used for other components of the house. Alright, so here we have a uh, simple little house with a uh, line of trusses going down the length. Now on any house there's a number of forces that act upon it. You have shear forces and racking forces, but the one we're going to look at today is what's known as an uplift load. And that basically means when the wind blows on the house it is trying to pull that roof off. And I'm going to show you how that works. So here we have just a little drawing of a house. Let's throw some wind force in. So here's the wind coming along and over the roof. You'll find that as the wind comes over, the air is getting slightly compressed as it gets pushed up over the roof. But when it comes over, the air is trying to stretch out and it creates this little low pressure area. And a low pressure area really is just a fancy way of saying that the air is trying to pull the roof off and throw it in the neighbor's backyard. Unless, of course, the roof is adequately tied down or fixed on either side there and there. And we're going to talk today about making sure that these fixings are strong enough to resist the amount of load placed on that roof by the wind forces trying to pull it up. So let's take a look at a plan view of a simple house. We'll throw some trusses in, just some straight trusses, just like our little model. So the figures I'm going to use are probably not very realistic, but I'm going to use easy figures to make the maths easy to calculate. So let's say we have a roof area of 100 square metres. In this little drawing we've got five trusses, so if we divide that area up by the five trusses, that means each truss is taking around about 20 square metres of roof area. Now I know what some of you are thinking, you're thinking the two end trusses actually have less area and less load on, and that is correct, but I'm ignoring that fact just to get across the, the concept of what we're explaining here. So these trusses, they all share the roof load, and they also share the uplift load that is imparted on that roof. For the sake of example, here's a truss down here which is taking around about 20 square metres of roof area. And that means at each end of this truss where they are fixed in, each of those fixings are each taking about 10 square metres each of roof area. And if I draw that area in, this fixing here, it's basically taking half the truss and also half the distance to the fixings on the next trusses beside it. And that is how much area that that fixing is tying down. So there's two phrases that we're going to be using today when we calculate this area. One is uplift load width, and that is basically if you measure all the way from the end of that overhang all the way to the end of this overhang, Half that distance is the uplift load width. Half the width of the building plus the overhang. The other measurement we're going to look at is this distance across here, the width of that area, which equals the spacings of the trusses. Because it's going halfway to there and halfway to there, if I slide that over, you'll see that it's actually exactly the same distance as the spacing between the trusses because it's taking half the spacing on one side and half the spacing on the other, it equals the spacing. So that is going to come up a little bit later in this video. Uplift load width times truss spacing. And that gives us how much area that this fixing has to tie down. And the book we're going to use to work all of this out is the 1684. Now this is the part two. Uh, I'm using this one because my building business was based in Brisbane, and which is a non-cyclonic area. If you're based in somewhere like perhaps northern Queensland and the cyclonic areas, you'll be using part three, but it'll be exactly 
the same process as using this one. So if you have a copy with you, I recommend you grab it and have it sitting beside you so that you can open it up and go through these tables while I do it on the video. Let's look at a quick process. This is a flowchart that I've done up. This is not out of the 1684. This is just one I've done up. And this just shows us a simple way of working out what fixings we need in order to resist the loads that are going to be placed on it. So step one, we need to work out if it's going to be a nominal or specific fixing. So those phrases I'm going to explain in a moment as we go through the table. When we go to this table here, table 9.2, that's going to tell us which type we want. So if we want a nominal fixing, that's very easy to work out. We simply go to the fixings in table 9.4 and it tells us exactly what we're going to use. And once we look in there, that will give us the answer. You don't need to worry about what this means. Fill in the answer sheet. That's just for my students. So back to the beginning here. If this table tells us we need a specific fixing, well then there's two things we need to work out. We need to work out exactly how much uplift force is going to be placed on that fixing and that is where we're going to use that area we just discussed. We also need to work out what the joint group of the timber is and that just basically means how well the timber can hang on to the nails or the screws that are going to be put into them. So a piece of softwood is not going to hang on to a nail as well as a piece of hardwood is. And that ability to hang on to fixings is called a joint group. Once we have those two figures, we'll take them both down into this table, table 9.21. And that will be the spot where we select what we're going to use to tie that truss down. All right, so let's start at the beginning. Nominal or specific fixing, table 9.2. Let's skip over to table 9.2. Here it is here. So there's some things you need to know. First of all, you need to know what wind classification your house is in. If you're a carpenter or a builder, that will come straight off your plans. It'll be marked there. If you're a building designer and you need to draw the plans, well, then there's a process to go through to work that out, which I'm not going to cover in this video, but it's all based on where the house is being built. So we're going to assume that we're building a house in an N2 area, which is a, a good deal of Brisbane. Uh, any, any house that might be in the middle of a housing estate would most likely be in an N2 area. And let's imagine we're going to be building it with a tile roof. So this is the column I want to be working in. We need to find out the component that we want to tie down. Uh, so here it is here, rafters or trusses, and it's trusses we're interested in. So I'm going to slide across there into this bay. That tells us we need a nominal fixing. And a nominal fixing is just basically means the minimum fixings that you would want in anything. There's this is basically saying there's not enough wind load on a tile roof in an N2 area to warrant specifying a stronger fixing. And that's what a specific connection is. Something that needs extra strength in order to resist a calculated force. But tile roof in an N2 area, nominal fixing only. And if you notice down here, N nominal fixing, minimum requirement, connection only referred to clause 9.5. So let's go to clause 9.5. There's a bit of information in there to read, but I'm going to skip straight down to the last sentence. Nominal fixing requirements for most joints are given in table 9.4, which is that table in my flowchart. So let's go to table 9.4. Here it is. We've got the floor framing components here, the wall framing ones there, but we're interested in the roof framing. So let's zoom in on this part of the table down here. There's our roof framing. Here we go, standard trusses. That's what we're interested in. So when we go into the minimum fixing, we've got a choice. We can either choose one framing anchor with three nails each side, or we can throw in a strap with a couple of nails in there. And that's it. That's a nominal fixing chosen. So let's go back to our flowchart. We've 
done an example using a nominal fixing. Let's look at a specific fixing. So we're going to change the type of house we're going to use. And we're going to be looking at these two items here. So here's our chart, back to the beginning. N2 area, only this time we're building a house with a sheet roof. We slide down to the row that has our trusses in it and it says S4 specific fixing. Specific connection may be required for uplift forces, refer clause 9.6 and there's that, that clause we mentioned earlier, 9.6.4 is within here. We're going to look at that 9.6.4. So let's go back to our flow chart for a moment. This is what we're going to do first. We're going to calculate how strong the fixing needs to be. And this table is what we're going to use there. So let's find that clause. Here we go, 9.6.4, wind uplift forces. So there's a bit of information in here, but this sum here, this is where we're going to use that area that we used before. We mentioned uplift load width times spacing. Those two together give us the area it's tying down. But we also have to times that area by the uplift pressure, which is this table here. So same process. There's our wind classification, N2. We're using a sheet roof, so we're in this column. And here's our row with trusses. That's the row we're interested in. So we slide across, and that number there, 0.74 kilopascals per square metre of force on that roof. This uplift load width times our spacing gives us the area. So let's skip back to our plan. Here it is here. The area that fixing is tying down is 10 square metres worth. So we just go uplift pressure 0.74 times our area. So 0.74 times 10 square metres means 7.4 for the strength of our fixing. So our fixing has to resist 7.4 kilonewtons of force. All right, what is next? Let's go back to our flow chart. The other thing we need to work out is the joint group of the timber so that we know how well that timber will hold on to the nails or screws or whatever they end up being. So we need table 9.15 for that. All right, let's find table 9.15. Here we are here. So you'll notice joint groups are always J groups. They're either J or JD. D stands for dry. You'll notice anywhere it says seasoned, it's a JD with a number. If it's unseasoned, it's J with a number. All right, so D for dry, meaning seasoned. So we just pick which timber it is we're using on this job. Now, most trusses that I've ever put up in my life were made with radiator pine. It's the, pretty much the standard framing pine used in most housing estates. You'll notice we've got a, a choice. It could be hard in or hard out. And perhaps I don't know exactly which type is going to come when it gets delivered. So I'm just going to go worst case scenario out of those options. So I'm going to go to JD5 because that's a little bit weaker than JD4. The lower the number, the stronger the timber is. You'll notice the hardwoods drop down to a 2. So I'm going to go JD5, which is worst case scenario for radiator pine. All right, now I have my two figures that I need. I have my joint group of JD5 and I have my uplift force of 7.4 kilonewtons. So back to my flow chart. I'm going to use these two figures and I'm going to drop down into this table here, table 9.21. And this is where we're going to choose what we need. So here is table 9.21. Now it might be a little bit hard to see on the screen, it might be a bit blurry, so I'll talk through this this column here, right there. That's my JD5 column. 
and here's a choice of a number of fixings. So this first one here just says two three inch skew nails. And if I slide down this column, this says hand nails, so two three inch hand nails driven into that. This figure here is 0.34, not nearly enough. We need to go a bit further. If I use the thicker hand nails, that's 0.4, still not enough. Let's slide down a bit. A framing anchor with four nails each end, one framing anchor gives me 2.9, still not enough. Let's keep going down. Oh, this one's close. This is a strap, galvanized iron strap with three nails each end, that's what that says. Two straps will give me 6.9, that's closer, but just not quite there. So we're going to have to go over the page to the rest of this table. Okay, the next page here, there's our column JD5. This first number is 13, that's heaps. So what does that mean? That means a galvanised iron loop strap, which basically means it goes over the truss, under the top plate, and up behind the top plate. That's a looped strap. Down here, JD5 requires five nails each end. So a loop strap, five nails each end. One strap is going to give me 13 kilonewtons of force holding the end of that truss down. And that's heaps. And there we are. We have chosen what fixing is required for that, the end of that truss. Now, that process that we've just gone through, let's go back to my flowchart. So this process is the same process for any fixings that you might be designing for a house, whether it's nailing the floor frame in, the wall frames, roof frames, anything that has any kind of uplift force on it. Thank you and good luck.